Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. All right, well, Shabbat Shalom. We're in a series on the book of Proverbs. Today's part seven. We're going to look today at the theme of Yerat Adonai, uh, the fear of the Lord. So we're going to have a bunch of different Proverbs. Uh, we're going to put up on the overhead here from uh, chapter 3, 9, 16, 19, 20, 23, and 28. A bunch of, a bunch of verses. It says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your paths. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Then one rests content, untouched by trouble. Who can say, I've made my heart pure. Uh, I'm clean from my sin. Let not your heart envy sinners. But continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there's a future and a hope. You will not be cut off. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. But whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Amen. Today we're focusing on this theme that runs throughout the whole book of Proverbs, indeed throughout the whole Bible. Uh, The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Uh, The theme of the fear of the Lord in the book of Proverbs comes up a lot of times. For example, Proverbs 1, 7 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, many of the places uh, in the book of Proverbs. It also comes up throughout the scriptures. Job 28, Psalm 110. It's one of the main themes of the Bible. That the beginning, the foundation of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Now, now what does this mean? It's a very important term. For example, the Lord says in Job 1.8, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth, blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. The fear of the Lord is a summary of everything we're supposed to do and to be. So so why is it so important and what's it for? Uh, Let's look at this theme under four topics uh, on the overhead. Uh, The fear of the Lord is, number one, it's beginning with God. It's knowing God. It's trusting God. And then finally, number four, it's discovering the grace of God. So, so it's, be, it's beginning with God. Look again at, at Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Let's start with this word of beginning, tekalah uh, in Hebrew. Uh, we're told your foundation, your, um, we're told your relationship with God is the beginning, is the foundation for wisdom. But in Proverbs 1.7 Where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, it shows us that what the book of Proverbs is saying is that the fear of the Lord, it's comprehensive. It's far-reaching. It's saying your relationship with God is the foundation even of your thinking. Your relationship with God and what you believe about God completely determines what you know about the world uh, and how you know it. It determines everything that you know uh, and how you know it. Now, in our modern and, and postmodern era, uh, we don't think at all like that anymore. Uh, in our secular culture, we believe, yeah, you, you might have faith in God and, and the Bible, but you're to keep that private, and you're to keep it separate uh, from the public sphere uh, and government and education and, and media and law and from the rest of your life. Uh, just wall it off in a separate little enclosed compartment. Our modern society believes that faith is opposed to reason. And we believe that reason, thinking, is something uh, that we can and should uh, be operated apart from religious faith. Uh, And it tells us all sorts of things that that we need to know about the world uh, apart from religious faith. For example, famous actor was uh, Christopher Reeves, former actor who played Superman. Uh, He said this when he was addressing uh, the students at Yale University. He said, when matters of public policy are debated, No religion should have a seat at the table. And sadly, there's a very typical belief uh, in our society. Your religious beliefs are only for your private life. 
But when it comes to public discourse, discussing public matters, there we need to use reason, meaning only those things that we can empirically prove. And we must keep religious faith out. But the book of Proverbs says the exact opposite. The whole Bible says the exact opposite. The biblical scholar Gerhard von Rad, he says this on, on the overhead. He says, the book of Proverbs teaches that faith is, that is not only not opposed to reason, but constitutes its very possibility, its connection to reality. What he's saying, what the book of Proverbs is saying, what the Bible says is that your faith view of reality, your faith view of God, uh, your religious faith, and by the way, everyone's got one, whether they realize it or not, your faith is the foundation from which all of your reasoning proceeds forth. That's what the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is saying here. It's saying it's the beginning of knowledge. Let's look at some examples. Let's take the modern enlightenment premise articulated by Christopher Reeves uh, that the only things that we can be really sure of are things that are scientifically proven. You may have your beliefs about morality, about God. That's fine as long as you keep it private. Uh, but the only things we can really be sure of are the things that are scientifically proven on the overhead. But note that that very statement, that we can only be sure of things that are scientifically proven, that statement can't be scientifically proven. <laughs> and therefore, on its own terms, we can't be sure of it. If you don't believe that, that anything in this world has a supernatural cause, fine. But that's only what you believe. But recognize it's only a belief. You're taking that position by faith. You can't prove that. And once you've adopted that as your faith view of reality, all your reasoning then proceeds forth from it. And you screen out everything that doesn't fit in. So, so look, you have, a, you have a view about reality that you've taken by faith. Uh, and then all your reasoning proceeds from it. Your understanding of God is the beginning of your knowledge, whatever that understanding is. What you think of God affects all your reasoning. Here's another example. People today often say, everyone must be free to determine what's right or wrong for them. Ever hear that before? Right. Don't impose your morality on me. Don't tell me what I have to, be I have to believe this or that. Every individual should be free to determine what is right or wrong for them. But that assumes something. There would only be the case if there were no God. Or if there was a God that he does not hold you accountable for your beliefs and your behavior. That may or may not be true. But to maintain that position that, that all morality is, is in essence uh, re uh, relative and subjective. That, and we should all be free to determine what's right or wrong for us. That assumes a particular view of God. Which you can't prove. You're either assuming there is no God or that he doesn't hold you accountable. But how do you know that? You don't know that. You hope it's true. You're betting your whole life that that's true. You're betting your whole destiny on it. But it's a faith act on your part. It's a faith leap. And once you've made that leap, then all of your reasoning, everything else you do, proceeds from it. Secular people love to say, well, I'm filled with doubts, and you, know, you religious people, you're filled with faith. Nonsense. Everyone is living their life filled with all kinds of faith leaps. Everyone is faith-filled. David Klingenhofer writes for the Jewish Forward. Uh, he writes this uh, on the overhead. He writes, what we're observing in our society seems to be a struggle of religion against no religion. But in actuality... It's the conflict of various religions, including the religion of secularism. If you object that secularism isn't a religion because it has no deity, you need to remember that other faiths, other faiths like Zen Buddhism, for example, also lack a belief in God. What is a religion then? Simply this, a system of beliefs explaining where life comes from, what life means, and what we as human beings are supposed to be doing with our few allotted years here on this earth. Answers to these questions are not provable. They're taken on faith. In other words, everyone has a faith view of reality. 
There's no such thing as a view of reality that doesn't include some things that you take just on faith. And once you, you've leaped to that faith view, all of your reasoning proceeds forth from that. Most secular people are living under this illusion that they're skeptical uh, and they're neutral and they really don't know what they believe about God. But that's not true at all. Everyone has to base their entire life and all their reasoning on some view that they take by faith of God and about God. Even if you say, nobody can know, how do you know that? Nobody can know about God. How do you know that? <laughs> you don't. It's just your faith view about the knowability of God. Maybe it's what you hope is true, but, you, but realize you're taking it on faith. And when people who think they're skeptical begin to see their entire life as being controlled and determined by their particular uh, view that they take on faith, of the view they have of God and of spiritual reality, it's a shock to them. Sheldon Van Auken was this, this, this secular skeptic who became a believer. He wrote this about his conversion, put it on the overhead. He wrote this. Uh, I saw a gap between me and Messiah. How was I to cross that gap? If I was going to stake my whole life uh, on the risen Messiah, I wanted proof. I wanted certainty. I wanted letters of fire across the sky. But I got nothing. But then one day I realized, my God, there was not only a gap before me, there was a gap behind me as well. And so there would have to be a faith step either way. I suddenly realized I couldn't prove Yeshua was God, but by God, there's no certainty that he wasn't. This wasn't to be born. And I realized I couldn't reject Yeshua without a leap of faith. There's only one thing to do when I saw that gap, both before me and behind me. I flung myself over the gap toward Yeshua. Do you see what he said? He said, when I realized my life was already being determined, that I already had bet the farm on a particular view of God, which, which can't be avoided, one way or the other, I'm betting my whole life, my whole destiny. Indeed, for all of us, the beginning of all your wisdom, the beginning of everything is always what you think about God. And once he realized that, it was easier for him to start considering Yeshua faith. And for anyone here who's struggling with committing your life to the Lord, I pray you'll come to the same realization. So now, what does this mean personally? It means your relationship with God must be absolutely central. It, your relationship with the Lord can't be merely something that enriches you spiritually, the way like your, your gym membership enriches you physically. No, it can't just be another thing on yourself. Another add-on? Another way to help you live a, a better life? No, look on, on the overhead. Your relationship with God must be the most central, the most important thing in your life. Every school you decide to attend, uh, every job you take, uh, every place you live, every relationship you went to into, everything you do should always be done with this question in mind. How does this affect my relationship with the Lord. The question is not, how can I use God to, to, better, to better live the, the life I want to live? No, the question ought to be, how is my life I'm living right now getting me to God on the overhead? And how must I change my life? Because getting to God is the most important thing in the world. The bottom line is this. I'm going to be out of touch with reality unless I'm in touch with the real God. Because Wisdom is being in touch with reality. So the overhead, number one, the fear of the Lord is not starting with something else and then using God to get there, but rather the fear of the Lord is beginning with God. Number two, the fear of the Lord is knowing God. Let's talk about this term fear, uh, ure. It appears over 100 times in the Bible. Now, when pe most people read this term, the fear of the Lord, they assume it means to be scared of the Lord. So when the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, it's saying, is it saying, be scared, be very scared of the Lord? No, that's not what it's saying. 
Let's look at how it's used in the scriptures. Look at Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. The text says, What does the Lord your God, uh, your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God and to love him and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul? So notice here this verse from the Torah how love and fear are, are connected. The text doesn't say you can either fear the Lord or love him. No. Rather, it says the more you fear him, the more you love him. They're linked together. Look at Psalm 130, verse 4. But with you, Lord, there's forgiveness. Therefore, I fear you. Now, if the fear of the Lord meant being scared of the Lord, then the more forgiveness I get of him, the less scared I'd be, right? But this verse says the exact opposite. The more forgiven I am, the more I fear him. Because the fear of the Lord is not being scared of him. Rather, the fear of the Lord is enhanced by God's love. Uh, Psalm 130, verse 4, the psalmist is saying, the more love and forgiveness I felt, the more God lavished his love on me, the more I feared him in this biblical sense of fear. So what does this mean? If you read all the text together in the scriptures, uh, this is what comes out. Uh, here's, here's a definition for you. We'll put it on the overhead. The fear of the Lord is a life rearranging, joyful awe and wonder before the greatness of who God is and what he's done. Again, biblically, the fear of the Lord is a life rearranging, joyful awe and wonder before the greatness of who God is and what he's done. Okay, why use this term fear then? Well, first, one of the reasons why this, this joy is called a fearful joy is because it's humbling. There's a kind of joy, on the other hand, that makes you look down on people. You know, if you get a promotion, you win a prize, you have, you have success, it, it can inflate you and make you think that, that, that I'm great. Uh, makes you feel important and possibly look down on others uh, that is weaker or less, less successful than you. But this joy, this, this life rearranging, joyful awe and wonder for the greatness of who God is and what he's done, this astounding joy, it's so unmerited, it's so unlooked for, that it humbles you. It removes the, the melancholy burden of, of self-importance uh, uh, and of always having to prove yourself. And it brings you instead to a place where you understand and respect weaker people better. It's one of the reasons why this joy is called a fearful joy, because it's a humbling joy. And it removes uh, the burden you, you, you've always ha of always having to prove yourself uh, and to build yourself up in front of other people. So it's a humbling joy. But the second reason why this term fear is used is this. Psychologists tell us that if you understand your, your greatest fear, you'll understand what your heart is most after in life. What your heart is looking for uh, most for its significance and security and identity. To determine this, follow your fears. So, for example, if, if you look mainly in life for people's approval, uh, if you're a people pleaser, your greatest fear is rejection. But if your main desire and pursuit in life is power, and you need to feel power to feel significant and secure, your greatest fear is humiliation, not rejection. If you're a people pleaser, you don't mind being humiliated if it makes people love you more. Your fear is a sign of what your heart most desperately wants and hopes in. If you're living for money, if you're living for your children, if you're living for your career, if you're living for your reputation, you're living in mortal fear of something, the loss of which would render life meaningless. And by understanding your greatest fears, what you most fear losing, you'll see your greatest love, what, what you're really living for regardless of what you say. So on the overhead, do you see how you can believe in God, how you can be inspired by God, how you can even obey the laws of God, and yet him not be your fear? It's possible for God to be someone you believe in. It's possible for God to be a concept, and yet not your fear. Not the main thing you're afraid of losing, uh, or the main thing you're afraid of grieving or disappointing. That's the main passion of your heart. But once God moves from being a concept to being the main thing you're living for, 
your passion, uh, the darling of your heart, uh, the, the love of your life, uh, the main thing your heart is desperate to get a hold of, uh, the thing that says, oh, I, I, if I have that, then I'll be somebody. Uh, if it's the Lord, uh, if he's your fear, then you move from knowing about the Lord to knowing him personally. Proverbs 9.10 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowing the Holy One is understanding. By the way, this verse is classical Hebrew poetry, known as synonymous parallelism, where, where the second line recapitulates and expands on the first line. So uh, on the overhead, the fear of the Lord, this verse is saying, leads to knowing God, not just knowing about Him. Again on the overhead, when the Lord moves from being a concept to being your holy fear, the thing you're most afraid of losing, the thing you most tremble before, the thing you most, because that's what you're looking for, that, because that's what you're after, that, that's who you want. When Yeshua becomes the core of your identity, when you're so astounded by what he's done for you that it rearranges your whole personality and he becomes the core of your identity rather than, than something else, then you move from knowing about God to knowing him. You can know a lot about a person by getting information. Uh, and you can believe that information, but it's not the same as an encounter with, with the person, is it? Uh, it's not the same as actual interaction. On the overhead, Jonathan Edwards said this, there's an infinite distance between being told and believing honey is sweet and actually tasting the sweetness of honey. In the same way, he says, there's an infinite distance between being told and believing that God is love and actually experiencing the love of God on your heart. In the same way, there's an infinite distance about being told uh, and believing that God is glorious, that he's all important, kavod, uh, and actually experiencing the glory of God in your heart. That's knowing God. It's a difference between actually tasting honey versus just being told uh, that honey is sweet uh, and believing it. If everyone tells you honey is sweet, but you've never tasted it, there's an infinite distance between believing it, knowing about it, and actually experientially knowing it. So let me ask you, do you know God? You may believe in the love of God. You may believe in the holiness of God. But are they existential realities in your life? Have they become real to you because you're grasping the loving, joyful astonishment of the greatness of who Yeshua is? So it's actually rearranging your personality. Do you know Yeshua personally? Again, Jonathan Edwards, he writes this in one of his journals on the overhead. He says, I began to have a new kind of inward sweet sense of the Messiah. I spent much time reading and meditating on him. And I found the beauty and excellency of his person. Uh, I found an inward sweetness that carried me away into his presence. I know not how to describe it other than to say it was a calm, sweet abstraction of soul from the cares and concerns of this world and a sense of being alone sweetly conversing with Yeshua, wrapped up in his presence. The sense I had of these things, uh, the world often, um, the things, things with the dog who often kindle, uh, uh, I'm sorry, kindle uh, a sweet burning in my heart, uh, a passionate ardor of my soul uh, that I can't fully express. What Jonathan Edwards is saying is this. He's saying, I began to experience this, this abstraction of soul away from the concerns of this world. That is part of knowing God. In the world, money is security. Love, acclaim, power, popularity, sex. That's the world's priorities. That's the world's definition of love uh, and security and significance. That's what's real uh, in their eyes. You may believe in God being love uh, and wisdom, but it's an abstraction often. It's just a concept for you. But when you know God, it all switches. Jonathan Edwards says, the things of this world that used to scare him or used to drive him, they now become mere abstractions compared to the absolute reality 
of knowing the love of God. The absolute beauty of God becomes not just an abstraction, but the reality. And things that used to scare me or used to drive me, they become mere abstractions. That's knowing God on the overhead. The fear of the Lord isn't just knowing about God, but an actual knowing of him. So again, let me ask you, ask yourself, do I know him? I mean, uh, um, or when you pray, do you just hope that, that somebody's out there listening and hearing you? Thank you. Thank you. Do you sense Yeshua? Do you sense his spirit within you? Do you encounter him on the overhead? That's the fear of the Lord is number one, beginning with God and, and, and knowing God. So number three, the fear of the Lord is trusting God. Proverbs 3, verse 4. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths and the overhead. Knowing God spells out what the fear of God is internally, to know God. To trust in God spells out what the fear of the Lord looks like externally in your actual practice. Uh, again, on the overhead. As we said, if God is your fear, there's nothing you're more afraid of losing. And if that's the case, you will trust him unconditionally. The fear of the Lord translates into unconditional trust. Many people start their, their relationship with God conditionally. You say, well, I'm going to start coming to shul. I'm going to start praying and reading my Bible. And I'll pray if I start to feel good. Uh, and I'll obey if, if my life starts to go better. The way many people start is, no, I'll give God a try and see, see if my life goes better. If I feel better, if I have more strength, if I find things better, uh, the time, things I'm looking for in life. But whenever you say, I'll follow God if, on the other side of that if, are your real trusts, your real fears, your real non-negotiables. If there are any ifs in your relationship with God, I'll relate to you, Lord, if. I'll pray to you, if. I'll obey you, if. I'll follow you, if. If there are any ifs at all, God is not your trust. God is not your fear. Something else is at the bottom of your personality. And you're just using God to get to that. But the fear of the Lord means unconditional trust. Think about this. Here's an example. If the, if the distance between our earth and the sun is about 93 million miles, and if, if that distance was only the thickness of one sheet of paper, one sheet of paper represents 93 million miles, then the distance between our earth and the next closest star would be a stack of papers 70 feet high. And the, di and, and the diameter of just our little galaxy would be a stack of papers 310 miles high. And our little galaxy is just a tiny speck of dust in, in the little part of the universe uh, that we can actually observe. Now, if, as the Bible says, the Lord upholds all of that with his word, the word of his power, with just his little pinky, is this the kind of person you ask into your life just to be your consultant or your advisor? Or your assistant. You know, someone whose advice you can take it or leave it. You can ignore it if you don't like it. Uh, or if you don't agree with it. A consultant whom you follow only if you think it will pay off for you. Is this the kind of person you bring into your life and you say, don't call me, I'll call you. Uh, I'll work with you, but only as long as I understand what you're saying and I agree with you. And as long as you're helping me get to my goals. Is that what you say to the Lord of the universe? Proverbs 3, verse 4. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. On the overhead, here's how you can tell if you're unconditionally trusting. Look at every area in your life. Every area. And ask two questions. Number one, am I willing to do whatever the Lord says in Scripture about this area, whether I agree with it or not? And number two, 
Am I willing to accept anything the Lord sends into my life, anything that actually happens in that area, whether I understand it or not? And if you say, no, 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 <laughs> if, that's, uh, if that sort of thing happens, I'm out of here, then you're not unconditionally trusting the Lord. There's something else besides God that's your number one fear, uh, that you fear more than you fear losing God. If it were a choice between that thing and God, God loses. Maybe it's sex or pornography. Maybe it's money or, or career. Uh, maybe it's fame or, or, or beauty or athleticism or achievement. Maybe it's romance or relationship uh, or, or position and authority. Whatever it is, if something else is more important than God for you, then that thing has become an idol. And it will, it will adversely affect your entire life. It'll block true wisdom and will make you a fool. Think about this, this, this above illustration and ask yourself, is Yeshua truly the Lord of my life? Or is he just my advisor and my consultant that I can take it or leave it? On the, on the overhead, be honest with yourself. If you're not willing to do whatever God says, as revealed in Scripture, and accept whatever he sends into your life, then God is just an abstract concept for you. He's not your trust. Let me give an illustration uh, on trusting the Lord. This is an illustration by Elizabeth Elliot. She was, she was once visiting a sheep farm in northern Wales. And she was watching one day as the shepherd was bringing the sheep, his sheep, to a vat of antiseptic, uh, which they had to go into. The sheep had to go into. Otherwise, they would literally be eaten alive by insects. And she writes this uh, on the overhead. She says, one by one, uh, John the shepherd seized the animals. They struggled to climb out the side of the antiseptic vat. Uh, but Mac, the sheepdog, would snarl and snap at their faces and force them back under. They tried to climb up the ramp on the other end, the far end. But John would catch them, spin them around, force them under again, holding them, ears, eyes, and nose submerged. And then she writes, I've had some experiences in my life to make me feel very sympathetic to those poor sheep. I couldn't figure out any reason for the treatment that I was getting from the great shepherd that I had trusted. And like these sheep, I didn't get a hint of explanation. But then I remembered that another shepherd had told me that sheep lose their direction continually. And even when they're found, it's very difficult to round them up. A lost sheep rushes to and fro, and when you find it, you've got to seize it, cast it down, tie its hind legs together, put it up on your shoulders, and carry it home. Do you hear what she's saying? She's saying, let me tell you what your problem is. You refuse to admit that the distance between the great shepherd and you as a, one of his sheep, the, the wisdom differential between you and Yeshua is infinitely greater than the wisdom differential between a shepherd and his sheep. And therefore, Sometimes the most loving thing to do with a wayward sheep is to grab it, cast it down, seize it, tie its hind legs, all without a word of explanation. Do you not see your anxiety, uh, your bitterness, your confusion? It's because you don't want to admit that differential. Why not? If there is a God, surely that differential would be there. For some of you, uh, you, you don't, don't you realize you're ruining your life because you're refusing to put yourself under the hands of the great shepherd? And it's ruining you. And for others of you, you're ruining your life because you're giving uh, um, the, 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 another, you're giving the great shepherd type prerogatives to, to, human, to mere human beings. So you're trying, for example, to marry someone who will fix everything in your life or you look to your parents to fix everything in your life. And when it doesn't work, and it never will, you get mad at them. But the great shepherd is the one you must trust, Yeshua the Messiah. We're by nature wired to be trusters. We need to trust. And the fear of the Lord puts you right smack, unconditionally trusting in the hands of the one you were made for. So on the overhead, the fear of the Lord is beginning with God, it's knowing God, it's trusting God. That's the fear of the Lord. Otherwise, he's just an abstract concept. 
But how do you know this? Uh, how do you do this? How are we going to have this life rearranging experience of the greatness of God? How can we trust God unconditionally, which we must? The key is number four, discovering the grace of God. You don't learn to trust God in the abstract. The fear of the Lord is not just some, some abstract concept. It's not just an abstraction. But rather, it's discovering God's grace is the key. Look at Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say I've kept my heart pure and I'm clean, I'm without sin? And look at Proverbs 16, 6. Through love and faithfulness, sin is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. Here in the book of Proverbs, in these two verses, is the very heart of the gospel. Look first at the second one. It says in Proverbs 20, verse 9. And the next overhead. I can repeat it again. There you go. Who can say I've kept my heart pure? I'm clean and without sin. Now, this is going a lot further than merely saying, well, everybody sins. Because in the Hebrew scriptures, this concept of cleanliness has to do with your fitness for God. Your fitness to be in his presence. And when Proverbs says, no one can clean themselves, it's not just saying everyone sins. It's saying everyone is lost. It's saying everyone is alienated from God, and you can't do anything yourself about it. Well, then what can be done? Next verse, Proverbs 16, 6. By steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. These two Hebrew words, steadfast love and faithfulness, chesed uh, v'emet, they create a, a bit of a conundrum if you try to put them together. Uh, because chesed is God's absolutely total, unconditional loving kindness. But emet means total, unconditional commitment to truth and to righteousness. So, but how can God be both totally loving and totally holy at the same time in dealing with unclean people? dealing with you and me. The logical answer is he can't. Uh, for if he were totally loving, it would seem like that, that he just let us off the hook and thereby compromise his holiness. Or if he were totally faithful and then holy and righteous, he wouldn't be able to love us and forgive us. And yet the writer of Proverbs says it's, he's, it's both by total love and total holiness that our iniquity is atoned for. Somehow, our sin is atoned for out of both of these divine attributes put together. Both of these attributes uh, are the source. Both of these seemingly opposite attributes are somehow reconciled together. And the second line says, uh, 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 in Proverbs 16, 6 says, By the fear of the Lord, evil is avoided. This is where the fear of the Lord comes in and changes everything in your life. It changes how you live. Seeing my iniquity atoned for helps to increase my fear of the Lord, helps me to turn from evil and the overhead, seeing that somehow, in some astounding way, both holiness and love have been reconciled, and that by free grace I'm saved, that, that that's, that's the ultimate source of the fear of the Lord. That's, that's the thing that's life rearranging, awe and wonder, filled joyful apprehension of who God is and what he's done for me. Seeing the Lord not in some general way, but as the source of both his steadfast love and his faithfulness that atones for my sin, by seeing that and embracing that, that is what changes my life. Now, how does that happen? The writer of Proverbs doesn't tell us, but the New Covenant Scriptures do. They provide the answer because centuries later, on the cross, they're making fun of Yeshua. They're mocking him. Uh, and they say this in Matthew 27, 43. They say, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him. See this issue where they're saying? Uh, he trusted God. Let God rescue him if God really wants him. Now, this taunt is cruel, but also logical. And here's why. It's clearly looked, at, they, it clearly looked like God had abandoned him. Indeed, they heard Yeshua himself cry out from the cross, Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They could see that God had abandoned him. And every place in the Bible, wherever God says, trust me, he says, trust me and I won't let you down. Trust me and I will not abandon you. 
So here, uh, here's someone whom God has abandoned. And so we conclude logically. He says he trusts in God, this Yeshua, but he obviously doesn't really, or else God wouldn't have abandoned him, right? But the crowd of Marcus at the cross couldn't see what we see. In the beginning of time, Adam came into the Garden of Eden. And God said to him, trust me and you'll live. Centuries later, Yeshua comes into the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. He was the second Adam, the founder of a new redeemed humanity. And God said to him, trust and obey me and do my will and I will crush you to powder. Yeshua knew that if he did the Father's will, he'd be crushed. He'd be abandoned. Why? It was the only time in history. It never happened before. It'll never happen again. But the message of the Father to the Son was this. If you hold on to your life, then they will lose theirs. But if you let go of your life, if you pay their debt, then they can have life. Their sins can be atoned for. And Yeshua trusted God absolutely, unconditionally. And he said in Matthew 26, 39, Father, not my will, but yours be done. But nevertheless, he was utterly abandoned. Imagine, as hard as it is to trust unconditionally, as hard as that is, then to know that it was going to result in abandonment, and infinite torture, why did Yeshua do it? For you, and for you, and for you, Hallelujah. and for me. And therefore, when Yeshua looks at you, and he says, take your hands off your life, drop your conditions, get rid of all of these ifs, follow me, whether you understand or not, follow me, whether you agree or not, Take your hands off your life. Give up your right to self-determination. Let go of your life. When he says this, he's the only God of any of the world's religions who's saying, I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't done myself. He's the only one on the overhead. And he says, if I did that for you, I let go of my life for you. I gave, I gave up control for you. I was abandoned for you. But if you give up control for me, you'll only be embraced. Now that's a deal. What are you waiting for today? You know, when God was preparing Abraham to be the, the leader of a new people, the Jewish people, he put him through a test, a trust test. Abraham went up, went up on the mountain. He was ready to, to slay his only son, Yitzhak, Isaac. At the last moment, the, uh, your, uh, the angel of the Lord, the Malchal and I, calls out to him, Genesis 22, verse 11, Abraham, Abraham, Hineni, here I am, he replied. Don't lay a hand on the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. But we can look at Mount Calvary, which, by the way, is the same mountain that Yitzhak was offered on, and see the greater Isaac. Uh, and we can say, now we know, Lord, how great your love is for us. For you did not withhold your son, your only son, from being sacrificed on my behalf. So now I can trust you. Not because you're some kind of abstract deity uh, who's in a, in a vacuum says, trust me. But because you, Yeshua, did not withhold your very life from me. Yeshua is telling you today, based on who I am and all that I've done for you, trust me, fear me, what with joyful, humbling fear, as your life rearranging, awesome joy and wonder, that you fear losing and fear grieving and disappointing, most of all, he's saying, commit your life to me, Philippians 2, verse 12, work out your salvation, how? With fear and trembling. For this will cast out every other fear. Proverbs 28, verse 14. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Hallelujah. Music team, come on up. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you for showing us that, that you're, the fear of you, Lord, encapsulates everything I'm supposed to be and I'm supposed to do. It's the beginning of everything. All my thinking, the foundation of, of my relationship with you, Lord, all my reasoning proceeds from
for my faith in you, Lord. And so my relationship with you, Yeshua, it must be central. Yeshua, for every choice I make, about everything, Lord, about what school I attend, what job I take, or where I live, the relationship I pursue, uh, who to marry, uh, what ministries to get involved in, help me to make every decision based on how it will increase and deepen my walk with you, Yeshua. Help me to live a life rearranging. Help me to have this awe-inspiring, awe joyful awe and wondering before the greatness of who you are and what you've done for me. Help me to live with that kind of fear of you, uh, a humbling joy, seeing what you, what, all you've done for me despite my utter lack of merit. And Yeshua, I want my greatest passion and my greatest desire to be you and you alone. Uh, we're, we're sure you are the main thing I fear losing and grieving and disappointing. Let that be my fear. Lord Yeshua, you are the main thing I'm living for. You're the passion of my heart. Uh, you're the love of my life. You're the core of my identity. Help me, Lord, to know you more and more. Help me to trust you and obey you unconditionally in every area of my life to hold nothing back. You're my great shepherd. Yeshua, you're the one who's atoned for my sins. And therefore, I fear you, and I love you, and I turn from evil, and I turn to you. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Shabbat shalom.